Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Mishari Mukbil. I have a consultancy company called Simple. We help companies uh, with digital transformation. Uh, what does that mean? That means if you're not using a calculator, it's probably about time you have one, like our, our buddies in the election commission. Um, so when, when I go through these projects with my clients, um, quite often it is after the fact that their software or IT project has failed spectacularly. And many people ask me why, why is our software projects, uh, why are our software projects failing? So I had prepared this slide initially to show this people, uh, decision makers uh, why it is that they are in the condition that they are. So uh, as uh, geeks, uh, I hope that also you get to learn a thing or two about how to communicate effectively to uh, stakeholders. So computers, right, um, in the span of two or three generations, we went from this, uh, this kind of setup to something very, very small. And the amount of uh, CPU power in, in the computers has increased uh, a billion times, right? I mean, there is nothing else that we have uh, that has uh, uh, evolved so rapidly. For example, building a bridge. We have essentially been building bridges the same way for the last uh, few thousand, uh, thousand years. Uh, can you imagine building software uh, uh, like that? It's, it's as if all of a sudden, within three generations, we went from uh, bricks to carbon nan uh, nanotubes, right? So here's a uh, quote, uh, as you probably know about the US sanctions on Huawei, right? Look at this part. The company's software engineering is like something from 20 years ago. 20 years ago. If I told, if I, uh, we're still building bridges like we did 20 years ago, right? But then if you build software like you did 20 years ago, it is a major, major flaw, right? What else? When I went to university, my university had a $47 million software project that failed. Uh, Hertz as well has their own horror story. $32 million in a software project that failed. $440 million lost in 30 minutes. And of course, uh, there is the Ariana 5 rocket disaster, also because of defective software. And of course, our favorite blue screen in, uh, in, in Microsoft. They make great products these days, by the way, since they uh, support open source software. So, so, so there's been a lot of soul searching, right? We, we, we really don't know how to do software uh, very well because there's no, there's no built up knowledge. There's no lore that passes on from one generation to the other because it's only been three generations. And with every generation, the technological leap has been light years ahead. However, we are starting to see some truths uh, which, are, uh, which seem to hold. So this is uh, the mythical man month. I recommend it to anyone who is uh, about to embark on a software project. It was written in 1975, and much that is written in that book still holds true today. So if it has held true for 25, uh, 25 years, it's like the Old Testament or the works of Plato. Um, it will, it, in about, sorry, not 25 years, third, over 30 years. It will probably continue to hold true uh, in another 30 years. So here are some highlights. Adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. All right. Um, as time passes, the system becomes less and less well ordered. Sooner or later, fixing ceases to gain any ground. Each forward step is matched by a backward one, and at the end, a brand new from the ground, a redesign is necessary. So who's had to face this? Who has had to rewrite your software? Yes, don't be shy. It happens to the best of us.
This was in 1995. You're not doing anything wrong. This is the very nature of writing software. Um, softwares tend, the software architecture, the way that the software is designed and put together tends to reflect the organization that wrote it. So how do we solve uh, so some of these problems? The first thing that I always like to say is that when you embark on a software project is to focus on value. Uh, what do I mean? So in a company, uh, when you design software, there's pro probably a whole bunch of considerations about uh, what features you need to uh, work on first. And ultimately, I say uh, it's very, the decisions become much easier if you start from the perspective of the customer and or the final end user and work your way back. And that is why I absolutely love open source software because as a customer or as an end user, you can participate in the process of developing the software and making it work for you. Uh, another thing that I uh, always say that people should do is uh, see it, touch it, and do an MVP. So this is a project that I worked on earlier, elect.in.th. From conception to finish, the project took nine days. One of the first things that we did in elect was to come out with a mock-up of the GUI. We put it out there and we, and we tried to understand how using this product was like at the, uh, from the perspective of the users. Recently, I, look, I was looking at a software project where it has been three years and there, and the end user has, uh, has no idea of what the final product is going to look like. This should be up from day one, right? So an MVP uh, is basically an incremental process like this. So you start from a basic beginning to see whether the concept works, and you work your way up. Frequent direct <laughs> feedback. Uh, this is also very important. There's a bunch of ways people, uh, people do it. Before, software engineering used to be uh, used to work in a waterfall process where the requirements uh, came at the beginning and the uh, verification came all the way at the end. That is a recipe for a failing software project. So there's a bunch of uh, systems that, uh, that people have talked about over the time. There is uh, uh, observe, orient, decide, act. Uh, there is... Um, uh, uh, I can't remember which way this went. Uh, check, act, plan, check, do. Sorry. So, but anyways, so there's going to be a few feedback loops. Um, the, the entire idea is that uh, each iteration is very fast. It's one week, it's two weeks. But people need feedback uh, about how the, uh, developers need feedback about how the software is working. Because at every cycle of the feedback loop, new ideas come up about how the software is used, and then priorities will change as you, as you uh, learn about what the tools can do for you, right? Uh, ultimately, it should feel, the feedback loop should feel a little uh, like a bicycle, where, where the input comes in, and that in turn de uh, develops the software, and which ultimately will take you towards the, the direction. So a, a really good software project really does feel a lot like, uh, uh, like riding a bicycle. This is important. Uh, write code to test code. I barely ever see this done. Um, so when you have your codes written, when you have your, your clothes, uh, code up and running, you basically have no idea how it's doing. Uh, there's no metrics, no system to actually tell you about the health of your, of your code. Right? Uh, when you have machineries in factory, there's always some sort of, of, of gauge, a mechanical system that tests um, a mechanical t uh, system, but then in code, it's getting more popular, but then uh, in the overall uh, scheme of things, it's still pretty rare. And when you write code without any, um, any form of uh, instrumentation, uh, then it feels, it is very much like playing Jenga. You don't know which change in the code is going to bring your entire system crashing down, right? Embrace change. The reason I say this is because it's, um, whenever code is written, whenever you have a software product, 
uh, it's like the discovery of, uh, of something like iron. You discover iron, you discover how to smelt it, then all of a sudden you have a hammer. You can use that hammer to then develop uh, other things. And so, uh, so you may embark on a software project, and then suddenly you dis realize that you have the equivalent of a hammer um, that you can use, which you can then apply it to many other parts of your organization. So priorities are always changing the, when people see what good software can do for their teams and their organization. So, which is why I always say, uh, be ready to change uh, as, uh, after you start seeing the MVP. Design for operations. Who here does operations? SK, I know you do. Eh. Yay. So, the poor operations people are in charge of keeping everything uh, up and running. And often, this, uh, the software developers and the operation people do have not talked to each other. The RMIT system, for example, earlier, the software was written, everything is fine, they deployed it, um, which means that the operations people took it and started running it. Then they realized that the entire system could only support seven simultaneous users in a university with several thousands. They deployed it, everything came crashing down. And, um, they could never recover for it. So if you actually design from, uh, with operations in mind from the beginning, you can avoid that kind of uh, failure. Also, I think that the Knight Capital example is also an example of uh, failure in operations as well. And lastly, uh, I, what I always say is, uh, as much as possible, open all the sources. Right? The reason for this is because when you build software, and you make it open source, two things happen. First of all, you think about abstractions. You think about the things that are important for your organization, and you think about the things that are just important in general. So what you get are these uh, generic pieces of software which you can then release, and you can attract other people to come in and help you develop your software, help you check it for, uh, uh, for bugs, and perhaps give you valuable feedback about how your third-party contract, uh, contractors writing the software are, are doing. Um, it, makes the, it makes it secure. Yes, it's harder, but I think that the payoffs for uh, what you get when you open your source code is huge. And which is why I absolutely uh, love FOSS Asia, right? Because it's just this environment of, uh, uh, of people who are get together, getting together to write software who are contributing software to the public, who are talking about software, and who are really pushing the boundaries of what software can do and what it is all about. So lastly, so it is not all doom and gloom, right? Um, you see in this room, there are probably a hundred pieces of software running from your watches from the, uh, to the laptops, to the projector screen, to the audio video room. So gradually, Mark Anderson says, software is eating the world. And we have had many, many examples of successes in, uh, in software projects, as we can see before you. So let's learn from it, and let's create some great software. Let's release it so everyone can, can benefit for, and learn from it. Uh, so with that, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much.